Shall we turn to Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 12 this evening? As Paul is giving us these little uh, sentence exhortations, he tells us in the last of the exhortations in verse 12, continuing instant in prayer. The Greek word is continuing steadfastly in prayer. One of the problems in our prayer life is our lack of steadfastness. We are prone to cease praying when we fail to see results, we get discouraged. Or another mistake is that we cease praying when we begin to see the results, figuring, well, that's all taken care of now. I don't have to pray about that anymore. And many times we lose the victory that we have begun to gain because of the lack of steadfastness in prayer. When I was growing up, there was a phrase that was quite common that was related to prayer. It's not really a scriptural praise, and I'm not really certain how theologically correct it is. But there are some things that just, you know, make sense, though they may not be uh, <laughs> approved by all of the theological circles. Uh, the phrase was praying through. And so often if you had a difficult situation, someone would ask, well, you, have you prayed through? And it was a phrase that was dealing with the issue of praying until you had received either the answer or the assurance in your heart that it was taken care of by the Lord. For instance, when Paul was praying about his thorn in the flesh, he said, thrice I sought the Lord concerning this. And then the Lord spoke to him and said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength will be made perfect in your weakness. So Paul would have prayed through on the issue. In other words, he didn't pray about it anymore because he had received the answer from the Lord. Now, it wasn't the answer that he was particularly looking for. As often is the case. We don't always receive the answer that we are particularly looking for. But we do receive an answer and that is what is important and that of being satisfied and that of resting in the answer that God has given. Now sometimes our prayers do not bring immediate answers Sometimes God sees fit to delay the answer to our prayer in order that when he answers, he might give more. I think of that story in the Old Testament, how that Elkanah had two wives. One of them bore several children. The other, Hannah, was unable to bear children. And thus, as he was going to Jerusalem to worship, 
The one wife had to stay home, I suppose, with all of her kids, and Hannah was accompanying him to Jerusalem. But she was distraught over the fact that she was unable to bear children, which was a cultural curse. And he said, what's the matter with you? How come you're not smiling? And you're, you know, why are you so down in the mouth? And she said, oh, I just can't stand it, not having children, you know. And he said, look, aren't I worth ten children to you? you know, I love you. You're my wife and all. And can't you be satisfied with that? And no, she had to have a child. And there had been a conflict between the two wives. And the wife that had so many children was just really chiding over Hannah, the fact that she was unable to have children. And uh, it would seem that Elkanah did favor Hannah over the other one, but uh, there was this horrible triangle thing going on in this uh, plurality of wives. And she no doubt had been praying for a long time that God would give her a child. But God had delayed answering her prayer. Why did God delay answering her prayer? She was praying that God would give her a son. God wanted to give her much more than a son. God wanted to give to her a son who would arise and be a leader of the nation. But before that could be, God had to allow her this agony, this time of steadfastness in prayer, this time of waiting while God delayed the answer so that her heart would be turned to God's purposes so that when he answered, the purposes of God could be fulfilled in the answer to prayer, giving much more than just a son, giving one that would be a prophet and priest to the nation of Israel. So, as she was praying in the temple, agonizing before the Lord over this problem, she finally was brought through God's delay to the place where God wanted her. And she said, Lord, if you'll just give me a son, I will give him back to you all the days of his life. I'll not try and hang on to him, Lord. Just give me a son and I'll give him back to you. Aha! This is what we've been wanting. God needed a man. The situation of the nation was so desperate, God had to get hold of a woman before he could get hold of a man. And he got hold of the heart of Hannah through this very disturbing experience of being in this marriage situation where she was being tormented by this other woman. And I am certain that in her heart she had come to the place of, God, just give me a son. Shut her mouth. <laughs> you know, I don't care if I keep the son or not. You can have him, Lord, all the days of his life, but I want a son. And I'll give him back to you. And God was wanting one that he could train from youth and use to be the salvation of the nation of Israel. And so the answer was delayed in order that when it would come, God might give more. And many times the answers to our prayers are delayed because God is wanting to do more than just what I see at the present moment. I perceive this to be my need. And thus I pray about this and I bring it before the Lord. But God sees what I cannot see. 
And there is something that needs to be worked out in my own heart, in my own life, before God can respond and answer in the abundant way that He desires to answer and to bless. And so, as I remain steadfast in prayer, we say prayer changes things. Very true. I believe that. Mainly it changes me. And so many times my heart is changed in prayer. My attitudes are changed as I am praying. And I find that even my prayers are changed as my heart and attitude is changed. And so we need to continue steadfast in prayer even though the delay of the answer may be discouraging. There is also another possible cause for the delay in the answers to your prayers. And that is in that great outside hindrance. It would seem that Satan has the capacity to hinder for a time or delay for a time God's answers to your prayers. We have a very interesting case in the book of Daniel where Daniel decided in a period of fasting and prayer and waiting upon God that he might really receive some direction from God. And he got together and sort of formed a pact with some of his friends that they would enter into this period of time and just really waiting upon God to hear from the Lord and get direction. And after 21 days, as Daniel was in prayer, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him. And he said, Daniel, 21 days ago, when you called upon God, he dispatched me to bring you the answer to your supplication. But that prince of Persia, Satan, got hold of me and kept me a captive until Michael, that great angel, came and set me free. And now I am come to reveal to you those things that you desired to know of God. Interesting. I don't understand it completely. You're dealing now in the realm of spirit warfare. And it's beyond my area of understanding. But the fact that it is revealed in the scripture, I accept it as legitimate. That there is a definite spirit warfare going on in prayer. And it would seem that Satan for a period of time had the power of delaying the answer to Daniel's prayers holding this angel who was dispatched to bring Daniel the answer for 21 days until Michael came through and delivered him and he came on with the answer to Daniel. Now I oftentimes wondered if Daniel had ceased being steadfast in prayer after 20 days and said, well, it looks like God's not interested in talking to me or revealing anything to me. What would have happened then to the angel? By the time he got there, would he say, oh, turn around and go back. I guess he's not interested anymore. I don't know. But there was a delay, and the reason for the delay, we are told scripturally, because of this spiritual warfare that was going on that was creating a delay to Daniel's prayers. Now, 
continuing steadfast in prayer. Why should we have to pray the same thing over again? Having prayed it one time, isn't that sufficient? Why should I have to repeat a prayer over again to God? It would seem that if I'm honest in my heart and, and I open my heart to God and I speak to him once, is praying then over the same thing, the second and the third time, a sign of lack of faith? Does it indicate that I really don't trust God or I didn't believe that God heard me the first time? Why is it necessary to continue steadfast in prayer? To begin with, I'll point out one thing. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he offered the same prayer to God three times. So he set a pattern for repetition in prayer. It says, saying again the same words. And this he did three times. Paul the Apostle, again, as we referred to earlier, concerning that thorn in his flesh, he said, Three times I asked the Lord to remove this. Moses kept pestering God about his desire to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And he kept praying to God that God would allow him to lead them into the promised land until finally God said, Okay, Moses, that's enough. I've had it. Don't speak to me on this issue anymore. It's settled. You're not going to do it. And I think that you should probably continue steadfast in prayer until God does say, all right, that's it. I've had it. Now don't talk to me about it anymore. I'm not going to do it, you know. And, and perhaps that's praying through. I don't know. We must understand the realm of the Spirit to some degree to understand the real thrust of prayer. Repeated prayers should never be intended by us to persuade God to do something against his will. That is not the purpose of repetition of prayers. I need to know that Satan is a powerful spirit force in the world today. Someone says, well, you really don't believe in the existence of Satan, do you? My first answer would be, Jesus did. And my second answer, if Satan doesn't exist, then man is far worse than I ever dreamed him to be. If these horrible things that are being done by people today are not inspired by Satan, then I didn't dream that man was as horrible as he actually is. Yes, I do believe that Satan does exist and is a powerful spirit force. And I believe that he is in full rebellion against God and that a great warfare, spiritual warfare, is 
constantly going on around us. And I believe that this concept of a spirit warfare going on around us is oftentimes the explanation to feelings and moods that we don't understand ourselves. Why is it that I feel so depressed? I just feel gloomy. I just, you know, why, what is this heaviness that I feel? I feel that it is many times the result of spiritual warfare that's going on all around me. I'm being assaulted by the enemy. I can't understand my feelings. I don't understand my mood. Why am I edgy? Why am I so touchy? I believe that oftentimes the explanation lies in the fact that there is a spiritual warfare going on. Now, I did a lot of experimenting with this. There would be times where our children would just be on each other something fierce. Bickering, back and forth snide remarks. And I could, you know, there was just this venom, hatred and all that they were expressing to each other. And I would feel like going in, because I'd be in the other room many times trying to study, and I'd hear this stuff going on, and I wanted to go out and just take them and pop their heads together and say, stop it! And, and want to become physically involved in it, you see. And I believe that that is exactly what Satan wanted me to do. He wanted to draw me into the thing so that I would become physically involved with this bickering that was going on between them because then he could work me over too. You know, I'd lose my temper and, and say things and, and I could get embroiled in it too. And I think Satan was trying to lure me in to the conflict. And so many times I would just bow my head in the other room. I wouldn't yell out there and say, Shut up! That's enough! Now there's sometimes I would. But I began to experiment. And I'd say, now Lord, I believe that this is an attack of the enemy against our home. And I bind that power of evil that's creating this disharmony in the home. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I bind these powers of darkness that are creating all of this turmoil. Lord, I rebuke the work of Satan in the name of Jesus because the Bible says, if you rebuke the devil, he'll flee from you. And you know, it would be amazing how things would just calm down and smooth out. I, I recommend you try this. You see, there's a real spirit battle going on around us. And if we're not aware, if we're not alert to it, we can just get beat to pieces and never know why. And then we feel all defeated. You know, I'm such a spirit, I'm no good. You know, I'm just totally, because I've been drawn into it and I... Stumbled once more and I blew it and I blew up and, you know, and, and now I feel guilty, condemned and miserable and, and defeated. There is a spiritual battle that goes on around us. There are spirit forces that surround us. And Satan is a very powerful spiritual force 
and Satan desires to hinder the will of God from being done in your life and he sets traps for us. The Bible speaks much about the snare of the fowler. And Jesus warned about the traps or the snares that Satan would set. Now, Satan sets traps for people and he sometimes captures them in his trap. And he begins to take them as a captive and blind them and hold them against their wills. Or he actually begins to so work in them that their, their will is more or less made ineffectual. They have no will against it as they are caught and trapped in his power. And we can look around us and we can see many people who have been caught in the snare of the enemy. He set a trap for them. They took the bait. They were snared and now they are captive. And Satan is holding them. And as he holds them, he blinds their eyes to the truth of their own situation. As Paul said, for the God of this world has blinded their eyes that they cannot see the truth. They've lost their sense of judgment and reason in this area. And that's what makes it so hard to deal with them because we're trying to deal with them rationally and reasonably, but Satan has robbed them from their reason. And have you ever had that frustration of trying to reason with someone whose reasoning powers have been robbed by the enemy and they just can't see it? They can't see what they're doing to themselves. They can't see the, what they're doing, the damage that it's doing to themselves and to others around them. And you think, can't you see? What's the matter? And, and, and it's so difficult to deal with a person whose mind is under Satan's power and they have lost their capacity of really objective thinking. And they become so twisted in their value systems and in their sense of judgments that they are destroying themselves and those around them, but they, they can't even see it. And they have no power to stop it. And to try to deal with that is the most difficult thing in the world. Satan has so twisted their thinking that they cannot think rationally on spiritual issues. I am amazed when a person gets in this condition how they can be so controlled by Satan that they can talk to you rationally on any subject that you want to discuss with them. You talk to them about the Rams' chances of getting into the uh, playoffs this year, and they'll say, well, now they'll just, you know, in the next three games, this, this, and this. And, I mean, man, and they're just all animated, and they're all into it, and, and they can talk very rationally and reasonably about the Rams or about the chances of the Angels next year getting some... Uh, you know, good, uh, healthy players and uh, what their potential is as long as they all stay healthy this year. And, and they can talk to you about, uh, you know, the, the latest uh, software for computers and they can talk to you about any range of subjects very calmly, very rationally, and then you bring up the subject of Jesus and they become totally irrational. They cannot rationally 
talk on the subject of Jesus, the Bible, or God. But they just are wild now. Don't want to talk about it. Don't let it know. No. You know, and they're just irrational. Normally, totally rational people. What is the reason for this? There are spirit forces, powerful spirit forces, that have so twisted their reasoning capacities that any time the subject of Jesus is brought up, they are so prejudiced by the power of Satan controlling their mind that they lose all rational ability of thought. Now, when I pray, I am entering in, prayer is a spiritual force and power. As Paul said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of the strongholds of the enemy. So, when I enter into prayer, I am now using spiritual weapons and I am engaging now in spiritual warfare. That is why it is so difficult for you to pray many times. That's why when you start to pray you get so sleepy. You may suffer insomnia. But you start to pray and you start nodding off so quickly. There are some times when I get ready to pray for a while, I'll usually take a notebook and pen with me because, you know, as I get down to pray, I start thinking of all of the things that I've forgotten to do. I'm amazed at my capacity to remember the things I've forgotten. <laughs> Important things. I, I should do them right now. Oh, you know, I better pray right after I've done this, you know. And I have found that I better just take a pencil and paper and I just jot down those things so that I'm not, you know, taken away from... It's amazing how Satan will do his best to disarm you when you go to pray. Why? Because he knows that prayer is the deciding factor in the spiritual warfare. It's as though you were walking down a dark alley and some fellow jumps you and you begin to try to defend yourself and out comes a switchblade knife. And he starts towards you. Now, the whole conflict with this person is now centered on the switchblade knife. All of my effort now is going to be directed to seeking to disarm him. Because I realize with that knife he has a decided advantage. So all of my efforts are going to be concentrated on the disarming of him in order that I might be able to again meet him on equal terms. Now, when we begin to pray, prayer is the deciding factor in the spiritual warfare, and so Satan concentrates all of his efforts in disarming you, getting you off of your knees, getting you away from prayer, because you are now entering into the spiritual battle, but you're entering in with a weapon that is the deciding factor, and Satan knows it, and thus he seeks to keep you from doing anything but pray. As I pray, my prayer takes on the characteristics of a spirit, force, or power. I am not a Sadducee. I do believe in spirits. I believe that spirits are divided into the good spirits and the evil spirits and that they do surround us and have a tremendous influence upon our lives. 
much more than what we readily acknowledge or know. I believe that here tonight there are spirit forces that have gathered in the meeting tonight. Angels. I believe they are here. And I think that there are angels good and bad here tonight. Some of you have brought good angels with you and some of you have brought some bad angels with you. But I, I am convinced, I, I, I believe that there are these spirit entities divided into two forces, good and evil, and that they are very interested in the things we're saying tonight. Now, when the spirits that are gathered with us here tonight, the angelic beings, when they came into the building, they came in through the walls or through the ceiling or through the floor. If they were coming from China, they probably just came right on through the earth and through this floor, you know. Because a spirit being is not restricted as we are to material obstacles or to time or space. If say there are a bunch of spirits in China this evening at 7.33. And they said, hey, why don't we uh, check out Calvary tonight and see what's going on, you know. <laughs> Just as quick as they thought it, they could be here. They're not limited to space. Now, if we were in China and said, well, I wonder what's happening in Calvary, you know, it'd take us quite a while to get our body back around to be here tonight. In fact, we wouldn't have been able to make it. <laughs> but a spirit can be transferred through space instantaneously and is not restricted by the material obstacles. So that our bodies do offer us certain restrictions, especially that of locality. And uh, we had to come in through the doors. Now, when I pray, my prayer takes on the nature of a spirit or a spirit force. So that my prayer as a spirit force for good begins to do battle against these spirit forces of evil. And as a spirit force for good, they can begin to defeat those evil spirit forces. Prayer takes you into the spirit realm and begins to do battle in the spirit realm. Now, interestingly enough, in taking on the characteristics of spirit, the prayers then are not restricted by time or space or material obstacles. So that if I receive word that a friend of mine in Florida is having some real tough, problems, that uh, there's come a real problem in the marriage, that Satan is really doing a trip on the family, I can begin to pray for them. And immediately as I offer my prayers, they become a spirit force there in the home in Florida. And as a spirit force, they can begin to bind and restrict those spirit forces of darkness. They can begin to loose that spirit of God in the situation. And they enter into the spiritual warfare and each prayer then is a spiritual force and power against the power of Satan that is holding a person or a situation in his grip. Now, 
through prayer, I have authority through the prayer to bind these spirit forces of evil and darkness. I have the power through prayer of loosing those spirit forces of good in a situation. So Jesus said, whatsoever things you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever things you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Here's a friend of mine who is taken captive by the enemy. I cannot talk with him rationally about the things of the Lord. The enemy is holding him as a captive. I can now get on my knees... And I can begin through the power of prayer, bind that force of Satan that has blinded his eyes, and through prayer I can begin to open up his understanding and cause him to become objective and rational. I can free him from this blinding influence that Satan is holding on his life. I can free him so that he can see what he is doing to himself and he can see what he's doing to his family or those around him. For through prayer, I can set him free from the force and the power of darkness that is holding him. So that he is then a free moral agent, free to make a choice. This word free moral agency has been bantered around, but it is almost a misnomer. Because there is no way possible that you can say that a person who is being held by the power of Satan is a free moral agent. He's not free. He's being held captive by the power of Satan. He cannot make a rational, objective decision. So the purpose of prayer is to engage in the spiritual warfare and every prayer then becomes a fresh blow against the power of darkness that is holding a situation or a person captive. And thus the repeated prayers. Satan must yield to the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Now, when a person is freed from prayer, they become a free moral agent. They can now look rationally at a situation. They no longer have this blind prejudice that Satan has filled them with. And now they are free to make a choice. And most persons at that point have enough sense to make the right choice when they can weigh all the options. It's only a person who can't weigh all the options that makes such stupid choices. Because they're not really a choice, you see. They are blinded and being held by the power of darkness. We have difficulty because we can see so clearly. We've been set free. And our problem is that of understanding. I can't understand why you can't see this. What's wrong with you? And, and I get upset because a person just cannot see. But we need to understand the spirit realm. And if we don't understand it, then we're going to find ourselves made ineffective in the battle, in this great battle that is being waged. Satan takes a person and holds him, forces that person into the mold. Now, 
God will not use force and God will not violate a man's choice. You can't say that about Satan. Satan will force a person and will control his choice. He robs a person of choice. One of the sad byproducts of a life in sin. You're robbed of choice. But God will not do that. God will not force a person to be obedient to him or to follow his will, nor will God violate that person's choice. So through prayer, I can set a person free to make a choice. However, the choice ultimately belongs to the person. My job through prayer is to set him free so he can have a choice. The thrust of prayer then is to see the will of God done in each person's life and in each situation. And repeated prayers become repeated blows against the power of Satan holding them. And repeated prayers are not to change God's mind or to persuade God against his will. So we are to continue steadfast in prayer because it is a spiritual warfare and it doesn't end. When Satan has been driven off of territory, he will counterattack to try and take back that from which he was driven. Therefore, we must continue steadfast in prayer even after we begin to see the beginnings of victory. We can't say, oh, well, look at that. Bless God, we don't have to pray anymore. You know, it's all answer. No. Satan always will counterattack. And he'll try and take back the territory from whence he has been driven. Jesus said that when a spirit is driven out of a man, he goes out into the wilderness places looking for a body to inhabit. And if he finds none, he'll come back to the body from whence he's been driven. And if he finds the place all cleaned up and empty, the key there is empty, He'll go out and get seven other spirits to come and take their abode. And the last estate of the man is worse than his first. We must continue in prayer steadfastly even after we see the initial results, Satan driven off, the life beginning to change. We must continue because that life must now be filled with the Spirit or the void will be taken up again by the enemy when he returns in his counterattack. Continue steadfastly in prayer, Paul said. Jesus said, Men ought always to pray and not to faint, or that is, not to give up, not to cease, continuing steadfastly in prayer. The next little exhortation is distributing to the necessity of the saints. The world's attitude is getting all it can. The Christian's attitude is giving all he can. The world says, get what you can, man. But the Christian realizes that what you seek to save for yourself, you're going to lose. But what you give, you're going to retain forever. 
If I give a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, I'll not lose a reward. That is something that I gain forever. And so Jesus taught it is through giving that one gains. The world's philosophy is the idea of, is through getting one gains. Jesus said no. It's through giving. So we are to give or distribute to the necessity of the saints. The body of Christ should always be seeking to take care of the needs within the body of Christ. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. The Bible says, bearing one another's burdens. Again, and look not unto the things of yourself or your own needs, but look unto the needs of others. God help us to become more sensitive to others' needs. Now, the beautiful thing is that I do feel that in a large measure this exhortation is being fulfilled in the body here. I have the privilege of distributing over $100,000 a year to needy people, helping them in their needs. And it's a blessing to be able to distribute to the necessities of the saints. We cannot feed all of Orange County. We're not really called upon to feed all of Orange County. <laughs> Even the government can't seem to feed all of Orange County with all of the help of all of you. Uh, the capacity of, of forcing you to obey this injunction. But we certainly should take care of the needy ones here within the body as much as possible. Distributing to the necessities of the saints. Notice necessities, not to the wants of the saints. <laughs> Paul said, you that are strong ought to help bear the burdens of the weak. Just a part of being a part of the body and that oneness within the body that the Lord desires. Given to hospitality in the New Testament, in, in many different places, uh, we are enjoined to be hospitable. Paul, when he was writing to Timothy concerning the qualifications of the elders within the church, one of the qualifications was given to hospitality. And in Hebrews, we are told something rather exciting, I think. It says, you know, take care to entertain strangers because you might be entertaining an angel unaware. So that given to hospitality is an important thing. Now, in that culture, it was something that was required much more. In that culture, they really didn't have hotels and motels and restaurants. And thus, a stranger coming into town couldn't go to the hotel and put up for the night, or he couldn't go out to a restaurant. He, he pretty much had to depend upon whatever he brought with him or upon someone opening their door to him. In the Old Testament, we see interesting cases of hospitality shown. 
When in evening Abraham was sitting at the door of his tent and the three angels were heading towards Sodom, Abraham said, come on over, you know, sit down and Sarah fix him something to eat. And hey, it's getting late, you be fellows better spend the night here. When they arrived in Sodom, Lot met them at the gate of the city and he said, come and spend the night at my house. Hospitable. Uh, it's a very important thing in that culture, this hospitality. In fact, they had some very strict rules about hospitality. A man who was a guest in your house, you were honor bound to take care of him and to take care of his needs above everything else. We have difficulty in the Old Testament when in the case of Lot even, and in another case we have it, and we have difficulty in our culture understanding it. When Lot had taken these men in who were actually angels, and the men of the city came and began to beat at the door and say, send these men out to us, you know, that we might know them. And Lot says, hey, these men are my guests. Don't, you know, do this horrible thing to them. Here are my daughters. Take them. Do what you want. And we have a difficult time with that in our culture because we don't understand how important it was in that culture to be hospitable and to show hospitality to the guests. If you were wanting to kill the man yourself, but he was a guest in your home, you would have to feed him, treat him nice and everything else as long as he was a guest in your house. As soon as he got outside, then you could draw your bow and do him in. But as long as he was a guest in your house, should someone come and try and take him, you'd have to defend him. Just a quirk of the cultural uh, practices and all. The, the importance of hospitality at that time. Um, Does culture then make a difference? Do we not need to be hospitable now? I think not. I think that hospitality is a Christian grace and that we should be given to hospitality. Again, it goes along with the distributing to the necessity of the saints. Now, the next one I have great problems with. So great that I dare not start on that tonight. <laughs> May the Lord work in my heart for another week or so on this. I find it extremely difficult to bless those who persecute me. That isn't honest. That makes it sound like I do it, <laughs> though it's extremely difficult. I find it impossible to bless those that persecute me. Now, I find it easy to bless those that bless me. <laughs> bless you, brother. <laughs> bless you, brother. You know. But if someone says to me, you can go to hell. Man, I want to say to them, likewise. <laughs> Blessing those which persecute you. How can we do it when it's impossible? Well, I have found that the Lord has asked us to do a lot of impossible things. And I have also discovered that at that point I have a choice. I can argue with God 
as I state to him my infirmities and why it is impossible, or I can choose to obey God. If I argue with God, I usually win, and I don't do it. But if I choose to obey God, I find that God gives me all that I need to obey. If I say, oh God, I can't do it, I just can't bless them, I hate them, Lord. Look what they're doing. Look what they've said. <laughs> so, we're going to have an interesting session. So may the Lord be with you, and may the Lord help you put into practice these important injunctions that you might indeed continue steadfastly in prayer as you begin to understand more and more the spiritual nature of prayer and the spiritual warfare in which we're engaged. Distributing to the necessity of saints. And you might even ask someone to go out for a hamburger as you're given to hospitality and uh, that sharing and fellowshipping together. So the Lord be with you and watch over and keep you in his love. In Jesus' name.